All right. So today we are going to be talking about singleness. Uh, the message title for this little portion is called "The Wisdom for Singles." Now, I had a lot of things I, I, I wanted to talk about, and so you know, if I had a whole sermon series on this, it would come out to maybe five or six sermons. Do it. Not happening. <laughs> so, so because I don't want to keep you guys here for five hours, I'm just going to talk about this part about this wisdom portion about. How do we understand even our own hearts when we when it comes to dealing with our desires for relationships, our desires for marriage, and and the struggle, what that means while we are indeed still single. Now to talk about all these things, um, really the, the chapter that people go to is First Corinthians chapter seven. That is the chapter people tend to go to to talk about singleness, and that's where we are going to go look at, uh, because there's a lot of questions that can come from 1 Corinthians, 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And um, if, I don't know if you guys ever read through the entire chapter, but I was trying to study it this whole week, and man, I, I struggle with it. There, there's a lot of confusing parts in that chapter. Um, and so I'm going to try to answer some of those questions today. Um, but what I'm going to do first right now is spend... Um, some time just talking about our hearts. But before I even get to that, I want to first define singleness. This is taken from this book by Sam Albury, Seven Myths About Singleness. I highly recommend this book. I, I just highly recommend it. It's, it's awesome. Um, it's, he is a British man, and he just writes really openly. He is single himself, himself and um, he just talks about how you know, really how he just deals with um, what it means to be single, but yes, they'll be part of the church family. Um, and, and there's just a lot of wisdom that he has in there. And, and this is the way he defines singleness. I, I agree with this definition. Now, we open the Bible. The Bible doesn't just single out. This is what it means to be single, right? They don't really have a definition for it. And so really it's being drawn just from the truth and the wisdom that we can get from Scripture. And so what we have here is a definition that I think is biblical singleness to be single means being both unmarried and committed for as long as we remain unmarried to sexual abstinence so it means to be both unmarried so unmarried when we talk about unmarried it's not just legally like not married but it's also underneath the church covenant under the covenant of other people to witness that and to affirm that marriage unmarried and committed to sexual abstinence Committed, committed to sexual purity, and and I think that's that's the part where we need to really ask ourselves: What is our current culture trying to teach us about what it means to be single, what it means to be married? They're, they're challenging all these different things, and a lot of it comes down to sexual abstinence, because this is really the biggest, this is really the biggest um, struggle. Right? Amongst our hearts, there's this, 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 this talk about what it means to be sexually pure. Now, I, I, I know I'm engaged. I love talking about singleness, though. I, I value it a lot. Um, and and I'll, I'll get into a little bit of my story about how I even got to this place where I really value uh, what it means to be single. But I, I really think that the church needs to talk more about this. I, I feel like. You know, I do agree we do need to talk about marriage, and we need to have a biblical perspective of marriage. That's really important. Um, but at the same time, the reality is that there are many people who are indeed unmarried. <clears throat> How do we speak to them as well? And, and I think there, there needs to be a discussion about this to understand what it means, especially for the church, to integrate them as part of the body. Right? We are all in Christ together. That means we're all in this, in this marathon together. And, and so we have to we have to understand what it means. And so I, I truly believe to have a biblical perspective of singleness, it will help teach us three things. A biblical perspective of singleness will help us t- will help teach us of how to value marriage itself. When we're single and we understand, I believe we do have a biblical understanding of what it means to be single. We will end up having a better value, a better way to understand how to value marriage in the future. Singleness, biblical perspective of singleness will teach us how to live as a church family. It will teach us how to live together as one 
with those who have a family, a, a biological family, and those who are living on their own. Right? We're together, we're all a church family. And, and, I, and I think sometimes it's unhelpful to, to have these distinctions in groups sometimes when, when even though we, we, they're not ill mean, they're, they're really good intention, it, it sometimes it puts a, a division in our head that these groups are divided. And that's, that's not what the church is. The church is united together as one. And having a biblical perspective of singleness will also teach us how to live for the Lord and not to live for our own, our own interests. But to recognize that our interests, our best interests, is the Lord's interests, and how to align ourselves with that. So again, there's a lot I can talk about, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and have us walk through one portion of text from First Corinthians chapter seven. So why don't you guys take your Bibles and turn with me there? First Corinthians chapter seven. And we're going to look specifically at verse 25 to 31. So, just to give a little context, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 speaks, addresses mainly about sexual immorality. Right? Chapters 5 and 6 is Paul's warning and issue against sexual immorality, saying you, the church, must be pure because we as a body we are the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit dwells in all of us together. And therefore, we all need to strive to be pure for the sake of the church. And then as we hit to chapter 7, Paul starts addressing the other side of this same thing. Because some people in this church are taking it a little bit too far. If you look with me at chapter 7, verse 1, Paul here He's responding to the Corinthians, and the Corinthians have this, have this one statement. It says, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. And so the Corinthians understood this. They, they wrote this down. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. And but the thing is that they're, they're talking, they're taking that to the extreme. They're, they're taking it to a point where they're saying, even in marriage, people should not be having sex. A husband and wife should not be having sex. And, and Paul saying, no, that's, that's not what we're talking about with sexual immorality. And so he, he wants to bring it back a little bit here to, to have a good balance, understanding, you know, what is our heart's desire going on here? And so Paul felt compelled to not only discourage sexual immorality in general, but he felt compelled to establish some guidelines, guidelines and wisdom on how to live out then our relationships with one another, our relationships in marriage, our relationships as friends, our relationships as the body of Christ. And so that's what chapter 7 is all fixated upon. It's, this, it's to set guidelines and boundaries for us. And that's what I want to get to here. The heart of chapter 7 is found in verses 17 to 24. Verses 17 to 24. In 17, verse 17 24, Paul here is encouraging each person to live according to where God has them right now, today, currently. You read me in verse 17. Paul writes, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. So Paul is saying, you know, if you are a student, live your life as a faithful student. If you are an employee. Live your life as a faithful employee. And it goes further than that. It speaks about who we are. If you are a male, if you are a female, live out those genders, identity. Be a faithful son, be a faithful daughter, brother, sister. And then, if you are single, live your life as a faithful, God-fearing, single person. Which leads us into our passage, verse 25. I'm going to go ahead and just read this for us. Verse 25. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. 
But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles. And I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The point of time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they are not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. You can split up this passage here into two parts. And in the first part here, what we see is this advice that Paul gives to us, simply saying, live faithfully. Live faithfully. Now Paul here in verse 25, he, he makes this comment. He says, concerning the betrothed. And I, I do want to talk a little bit about that. Well, the, that's the ESV translation. The Greek word for betrothed here is the Greek word of par- parthet- parthenos. And directly translated, that word means virgins. So if you're reading the NASB, that's the way they translate it, right? Virgins. Um, And so, in this case, I do prefer the NASB translation, but that doesn't mean the ESV is wrong for saying betrothed. What betrothed means is is pretty much a turn back then for engagement, for someone who's engaged. The ESV isn't necessarily wrong because later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 36, that same word appears... But I actually prefer the way ESV translated it then. Um, but for this verse here, verse 25, I do think Paul is addressing virgins. And what we mean by that is we're, 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 what he means he's addressing those who are unmarried. Those who have the potential to be married. He's addressing a question, most likely a question about how should single men approach single women. Especially when you set all these guidelines about sexual immorality. In other words, this is a session that should relate to you. This is Paul's addressing you guys here. And so what we see here then is Paul's advice here. Now I'm calling it advice. I'm not calling it a command because Paul says, I have no command from the Lord. It's, it's a judgment call. It's a wisdom call. But that doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't take it seriously. We, we, we should take it seriously. There is still wisdom here that protects us from sin. Remember, these are all guidelines and, and boundaries. It's Paul, what Paul is saying here is similar to like when we tell you guys, when you guys watch TV shows or movies, like don't watch certain stuff because they're, they're not good edifying for you. It's not necessarily a command to tell you guys not to watch these things, but it is based on wisdom to protect you from falling into sin. Right? And so that's what Paul is saying here. So Paul's advice here then, Paul's advice here, he's saying, look, I think it is good for a person to remain as he is. That means either to remain single, or if you are engaged, follow through with that commitment and get married. Both ways are fine. Both ways are good. Both ways are not sin. Now, keep in mind, when we're talking about engaged in this context, it's they're, they're, they're committed to getting married. But when we're talking about in our context today, we can talk about the same thing with, with dating. We can expand that out to that. Because dating should be intentional and purposeful for the sake of marriage. So, what we have here then, is that there's no direct command here about whether or not we should get married or whether or not we should stay single. Stand the command here saying, live Or the wisdom here is saying, live the way that you are today, the way you're called today. And that's really my heart for you guys as we're going through this topic tonight. Is to take hold of this advice and to to really to really have in your hearts. And and guys, I know I you know I was in college before, I sat in your chair before. And back in college, I I like girls. I I wanted to date. Right? I, I I wanted I wanted to have a girlfriend. And I'll, I'll be jealous of my friends who, who, who were dating. And, I, and it wasn't like I was passive either. I did pursue. I did ask girls out. And unfortunately, I, was, I got rejections. Didn't, didn't, didn't get dates in college. But, 
And, and at that time, you know, it, it did hurt. It was painful. And it sucked. And I struggled with this. I struggled with, with God with this, with my own heart. Trying to, you know, figure out, you know, what does it all mean? Well, what, what, am I doing something wrong? Is something wrong with me? And, and that's a common question, right, that we tend to ask ourselves. <clears throat> and, and so I, I want us then to, to really take hold of Paul's advice here. He's, this advice here is to really set us free from those worries and those burdens, those anxieties that we carry in our hearts when it comes to dating. He's saying, live out your commitment to God. Be free from all that. We worry about how you'll commit your life to God. Be who you're called to today. Be students. Be classmates. Be sons and daughters. Be members of the church. Part of the church family. And if you're dating, then be a good boyfriend and girlfriend. But if you're single, be someone who is just committed to God and devoted to Him. There doesn't mean no, he, he doesn't put one status over the other. He's putting everyone equally here committed to the Lord, to where the Lord has called them. Right? Now, Paul here ends this section right, at the verse, end of verse 28. He says, Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles. And I will spare you that. So Paul here wants to spare them worldly troubles. And I'm not going to get into worldly troubles in, in this message right now. Um, if you guys really want to know the, the down dirty glass PT, <laughs> uh, the world of trouble stuff, he, Paul actually explains more from verse 32 to 35, um, but that's not what I'm going to cover in, at least in this devotional. I'll try to touch upon that in the FAQ later. So, so let's, let's just move on to verse 29. Verse 29, we see a second section. To live freely. Don't mind emojis. I was trying to look for something. Dog, I was assuming a dog is faithful. And <laughs> to live freely. I, thought I, I wanted the handcuffs to be open. So, you know, we're free. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, live freely. Verse 29 and 31. Well, what we get here is Paul's theological backing to his advice. Right? Paul says here, live faithfully as you are now. But we have to ask why. Why is that? What is it? That, what is the theological backing to your to your advice here? Right? When we give advice to people, we need to have that some kind of theological wisdom behind it. So, what is Paul's wisdom? We see that here from verse twenty nine and thirty one, and, and he talks about these things. But the first thing he mentioned here is that the point of time has grown very short. The point of time has grown very short. He, what what Paul is saying here is that. This time is short. This, I mean, this time that you, wherever you're called right now, it will change. It isn't something that will last forever. This is not an internal calling. Whatever, you know, if you're a student, you're going to graduate, and you're no longer going to be a student. Right? Um, if, and, it's, and it goes the same way, then. If you're dating or if you're single, that, that might not be forever. Right? People do break up. That's a reality of the dating culture. But those who are single will get into relationships and they will come out of relationship as well. So these, this time, there's a point in time is short. And so what Paul is saying here, what Paul is advising here, is that everything that we have in this world will eventually disappear. And so what the theological truth that Paul is trying to back up his statement here, he's, he's saying, be wary of idolizing the things of the world. Because nothing in this world lasts forever. <clears throat> Instead, recognize that we are built and created for eternity. So our hearts, our hearts can constantly get this so distracted by these temporary pleasures. But we have to remember that the time is short. We will all die one day. I mean, that reality is brought so clear to us in the light of Corey Bryant's death. And this world will die as well. And so whatever we do gain here now will turn into nothing. And so, and so what this means is that we should embrace what we have today in light of living for eternity. I know it sounds like a paradox, but 
but we live in a world paradox. It's just, the paradox doesn't mean they contradict each other, it just means there's tension. There's tension. It's, it's the whole, um, what is it? N- not yet kingdom, right? It's, there's this et- future, but yet not here. It, where we have salvation, but yet it's not fulfilled yet. Like, there's always this tension in this life. That's the paradox. Life itself is paradox. And, and, that, and we have to be okay with that. We have to be okay with that because we aren't created with, we aren't created with infinite omniscient knowledge. We're created as beings underneath the sovereignty, the sovereign will of God who is infinite and knows everything. We weren't supposed to know as much as God. And so live as you're called today. Live as you're called today, but that doesn't mean who you are today will always be the same. Things will change. And that's what Paul is saying here. For those who are married, live as if you're single. Right? That's what he says in verse 29. For those who have lives, live as though they have none. He, he doesn't mean neglect your spouse. Right? He, he, he spends, Paul spends a lot of time in, in this epistle and other epistles like Ephesians to talk about marriage. To talk about what it means to live as husband and wife. So he's not saying, you know, don't honor and love each other. Paul here, what he's saying is don't make your marriage your ultimate satisfaction. Don't make your marriage your ultimate joy. Your heart will not be fulfilled by marriage. <clears throat> In the same way, for the rest of these, the, the examples you put here, if you're mourning, recognize that you won't always be mourning. If you're rejoicing, you're not always going to be rejoicing. If you... If you want to buy something, buy it and enjoy it. But just don't hold on to it so tightly. Paul here is saying, enjoy this world. Enjoy this creation that God has around us. Right? Go take a hike. Go swim at the beach. Play basketball. Sorry, all these exercise things. Go do what you want to do. Have fun. <laughs> There's so many good things in this world, right? That God created for us to enjoy. But don't make those good things your ultimate satisfaction. Because this world will pass away and those things will not fulfill you. Really, Paul is taking truth from Ecclesiastes. Why don't you turn with me there? Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes is found in the Old Testament after Proverbs, before Son of Solomon. (laughs) Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. It says, For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. So our, what, 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 this, what, this, what it's saying here is that our lives here will constantly be changing. There will be a season for everything. Everything will continue changing, season to season, including our relationship status. And Ecclesiastes, the, the, the writer here, is making a point that we could be so worried about all these things here on earth, but, but what's the point of all that? Right? He says, vanity of vanities, everyone will die. And what will happen then, right? What will happen when, when all that you gain just disappears? And so the writer of Ecclesiastes points us to God. In the same chapter, chapter 3, read with me from verse 11. He says, I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. And also, well, sorry, verse 11 was before that. Um, verse 11, let me start over. Verse 11, he said in chapter 3, verse 11, He has made everything beautiful in this, in this time. Also, He has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live, and also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift. To man. You see, Paul is taking this truth and applying it to the church. That we are all created for eternity. And yet we won't find that out. We we, we need to be fulfilled by the only one who is eternal, which is God. That's, That's where we can find true fulfillment. But yet while we're here on earth, enjoy 
Enjoy the creation. Enjoy this gift that God has given us. So Paul's taking this truth and he's applying it, he's applying it to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He's applying it to our religious status, to us being married and single. So Paul's saying marriage is a good thing. He's saying singleness is a good thing. Paul is trying to emphasize that both are indeed gifts from God. And we are free to pursue both. But because both are worldly gifts, both are also temporary. And so what we need to recognize is that both singleness and marriage have a greater purpose. They both point us to our relationship with God. Turn with me real quick to Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus here talking to the Sadducees. And the Sadducees, you know, present this case to him. Matthew 22, starting from verse 23, right? The Sadducees approach Jesus, presenting this case. You know, what if there's this, uh, there's this widow? This widow uh, had a husband. The husband died, passed away, and a widow remarries. And then the second husband dies. And the widow remarries again, and, and the cycle continues for seven husbands. And then the widow passed away, and they reach heaven. And when heaven, who then is this one woman's true husband? When all seven of them are there, assuming they're all going to be there, right? And, and, and we should take a look then at, at Jesus' answer here. Jesus' answer from verse 29, Matthew 22, verse 29. You are wrong. That's so direct. You are wrong. <laughs> because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, you need, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. So what Jesus is pretty much saying here is that there is no earthly marriage in heaven. That too will pass away. That too is temporary. It becomes nothing. And so marriage then can't satisfy us. Singleness can't satisfy us. We know that. We feel that. Now, our hearts are made for eternity. They're made to be satisfied by God alone, the eternal one. And that's why both worldly marriages and singleness, both of them point to an ultimate end. They both point towards our eternal marriage with Christ. And I don't have time to show you where I get that. You can find that in Ephesians, as we cover later in our series. But what I really want to get to here is show us that, you know, Marriage here. Marriages seek to imitate and prepare our hearts for this eternal marriage in heaven. Singleness, if you're going to be single for the rest of your life, it's, there's just going to be this longing, right? This hope in us, this desire for that ultimate end as well. All of it points to this one end, our relationship, eternal relationship with God in Christ. Because it is only there where we can find fulfillment and satisfaction. And, and this, this took me a while to, to figure out. I mean, I went through so much of my own personal lives just to, just to get to this place where I can say, okay, I get what this, what this means to, to live, not necessarily content with singleness, but to value it. Right. When we say when we say to, to have contentment in life, it doesn't mean there's no fight. Right? There is then be peace with contentment, but it's always a fight to get there. And and I struggled with that for a while. I tend to still struggle with it now sometimes. I remember when I was in college, there was an older guy, a friend of ours, told me Amongst a group of us, he pointed me out. He said, I was most likely to be the one to get married first from my group of friends. I don't know why. But 
it, it stuck with me. Right? It, 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 it planted the seed of expectation in my own heart. And, 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 it, and so I expected, you know, it, even if I don't want to admit it out loud, in my own heart, I was thinking, you know, when I start dating, it's most likely going to work out, right? It's going to be okay. I dated my first girlfriend. Um, I don't remember what year it was, but anyway, I was traveling a lot. <laughs> and I was being sent out to Seattle um, every week for about three and a half months straight. And pretty much I had to miss out on coming out to IT. Uh, it was hard to come out to church because I had to fly out on Sundays. And, and I didn't really have any function out there. After work, I'd just go back to my hotel change and then maybe I'll just walk around the block and find find something to eat um, and then I'll head back home and it got really lonely and, and I think it's that time when my that loneliness that desire just made me call up a girl and ask her out <laughs> and and then and then and then after several dates we end up starting dating and that didn't last too long and and then after that I, I dated again and then that didn't last too long either and then at that point, after the second girlfriend, second breakup, I, I told myself, I need to just, I need to figure out what's going on in my heart. <clears throat> and so I committed myself to say, no matter how much I desire to ask someone out, I'm going to be single for a year. And, and just really wrestle with my own heart. And figure out what's going on. Because I didn't think I'm ready for this. And I prayed a lot. But during that year, I dedicated myself to say, if I'm going to be single, I'm going to live out what it means in Scripture to be single. And in Scripture, in, in 1 Corinthians 7, it says, you know, serve the Lord God, right? So well, I took that and said, okay, I'm going to serve the church. I'm going to do whatever I can to be at church. I'm going to do whatever I can to be there for my friends whenever they need it. I'm going, and, but I'm also going to take some time to enjoy myself. So I'm going to try to go on vacations and, and go, go on trips and hang out with people when, when they ask me because I'm, I'm free to do so, right? And, and so I, I live my life and I really... <laughs> just started to kind of get a momentum, but there was still a tension in my own heart because I still wanted to get married. So even as I'm going through all that, there was still a struggle. I didn't, and life just didn't get any easier. I started seeing my best friends one by one every year, standing next to them as their groomsmen get married. And you know, if you look at my wedding myself now, you see all my groomsmen are all married and most of them have kids. And, and so I, and I, I stood next to them all of them, and then I, I was happy for them. But at the same time, I also recognized that every time I saw one we get married, we didn't really talk as much afterwards. And so again, there's this wave of loneliness that comes hitting back. And it was it was difficult. There was a struggle with this, and, and I was trying to figure out, okay, you know, I'm happy, but at the same time, my own heart is a tension, right? And, and I really didn't come to really appreciate everything until I, until I wrestled with all this for several years. And, and I did come to really value the joys of singleness a lot. Now, during those several years, I did ask, I did go on more dates um, and stuff like that. I did ask people out. Um, but but I, I started to see the appreciation, the, 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 the value of singleness, what it means to really have time. I, st- I started to hang out with my married friends as much as I can, whenever I can, but based on their schedules, because they tend to be busier with stuff. I don't know what stuff you get in, mar- in marriage life, but stuff. <laughs> and and I, I'll try to serve the church as much as I can. And, 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 you know, I kept myself busy. But I, I did really come to see just how amazing it is. And, and it led me to where I am today, where I'm able to serve as I am today, to wrestle not necessarily with my relationship status, but wrestle with my calling to, 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 to do ministry. It gave me time to wrestle through that and not have something else be in the place of saying, I can't do this, right? Um, I, I don't know how people do it when they're already married and then the guy feels called to go to ministry. Like, that's a huge life change. And I'm sure that must be a struggle upon the wife. And I was lucky I didn't have to necessarily wrestle through that when I made my decision to go to seminary. And, and, and so I, I can start seeing, you know, certain joys that, that come from that. And even today, while I'm still engaged, uh, while I am engaged, I, you know, 
while I say I value singleness a lot now, I still struggle with this. I recognize that God has called me here to move on. He, he has placed someone in my life today to be engaged and, you know, to be married in the future. But at the same time, I'm reading scripture and I'm seeing Paul says, it's, I wish it better for you to be single so you can serve the church. I'm like, oh, should I do this? I, I kind of want to do this, right? And I still struggle with that today. And a lot of times it comes down to me saying, I want to do it because I want to be that person that said I did it. And it's less about who God is. It's more about who I am. Instead of, and when I realized that, I mean, if you talk to me and Sharon, I, we admit this, that I, I struggle a lot with committing because I struggle with this fact, with this, with this truth about singleness. And I was like, I don't know if I should do this. And I struggle with committing. And, and that was hard for us. But when I finally said, you know what, this is where God's placed me. I'm just going to trust where God's leading me. Because God just taught me to trust him during my entire time when I was single. And now that he's given me a girlfriend, I should trust to move on with this because Sharon's awesome. And, and so I did. I, I decided, you know, I'm going to commit to it. No matter where, what it is, God has placed me here for a reason. I'm committing myself to this relationship. And, and man, there was so much more joy that came out of that once I made that commitment. And so I... And so I'm living this way now. And so I just want to encourage you guys. You know, live out your life as you are for God. But that doesn't mean you know, don't date anyone. It just means continue to remember where you're at. And continue to always seek after the Lord. There are three implications that we can take away from this. First of all, there's a recognition that all of us here are indeed born single. That is the status coming out. No one here is born with a ring on her finger. Right? <laughs> what about twins? Twins. No ring on her finger. <laughs> they have an umbilical <laughs> But the other truth about this too is that not all of us stay single. Right? Not all of us will stay single. In fact, majority of people can marry. <clears throat> But at the same time, we also recognize that not all marriages last forever. Well, marriages don't last forever in general. Uh, yeah, but, say. yeah, <laughs> marriages don't last forever in general. But let's also remember that not all marriages last entire lifetime, either. Very few couples die side by side together. Right? Those who are married will end up being single again when their spouse passes away. And so... And, and so therefore, those then who become widows or widowers, they're, they're going to be single again. And, we, and then they're going to be in another season of life. And I think the church needs to recognize how do we then serve them and still incorporate them as part of the family. Okay? But it doesn't matter at the end, because we will all have the same status in heaven. We will all be married to Christ. We'll all be married to Christ.